This is the chapter on exhaust. Of course you've already seen what is the reason, what is the point of having an exhaust duct on the engine. It's so that the angle of the air leaving the engine can be controlled, the velocity and the pressure of the air leaving the engine, leaving the, the exhaust pipe, can be controlled. Uh, there's a duct. <laughs> it's round. And it has some parts in it. Could be thermocouples, could be EPR probes, could be both. Let's say that you're looking up the exhaust duct. It's very likely that you're going to see several EGT probes. There's going to be more than one, so they can average them all together to get a more accurate uh, temperature reading. And it's also common to see more than one EPR probe. So you may look up the tailpipe and see two, or you might just see two, or you might see three or four EPR probes sticking up. And of course, there's going to be an inlet hole on the upstream side so that the gas is hitting it can uh, have their pressure, total pressure, measured. And of course, jet nozzle versus turbine nozzle. The turbine nozzle is at the turbine inlet guide vanes, the stationary blades inside of the turbine section, and the jet nozzle is talking about the exhaust pipe of the engine, the exhaust pipe of the core. There's three basic types of exhaust nozzles, divergent, convergent, and convergent, divergent. We're going to look at each of these three separately. Divergent exhaust ducts. If you look at the jet engine, and we've got an intake and some compressor blades, and some turbines. Um, a diverging exhaust duct is only going to diverge a little tiny bit. It's only going to diverge a little tiny bit. In fact, you could probably look at it and probably not even see the fact that it was diverging. And the reason for this is that on turbo shaft engines, you notice APUs and helicopters, they both have turbo shaft engines. So another place way to say this was where do you find divergent ducts, exhaust ducts? On turbo shaft engines, we're not trying to get exhaust. So all we want to do is make sure that the air can leave the engine as easily as possible. Convergent exhaust ducts are going to be found on any uh, turbine engine where you want to develop thrust. So an old turbojet, a turboprop, or a turbofan, as long as you're going subsonic they're going to have very slightly ex uh, divergent, or correction, convergent exhaust ducts. So here's the turbine blades. It's also very slightly, although you can actually see this convergence. So of course Bernoulli's theorem works in here so that if we make the hole smaller, it's like sticking our thumb over the uh, water hose, the velocity is going to go up and the pressure will go down. Now, what you do need to understand is that if we constrict this duct enough, if we constrict it enough, we can actually get this velocity up to equal Mach 1. And so what we'll end up having is, is we'll end up having a shock wave right here at the exit point. So the velocity will get higher and higher and higher until right smack at this point right here we get Mach 1.0. But we're not going to get more than Mach 1.0. If we continue to constrict it even more, we'll still just get Mach 1 and get a shock wave right at the end. But the pressure, back pressure in here will go up and it'll be harder for the gases to leave the engine. So if we constrict it past the point where it first hits Mach 1, we're actually going to be reducing our, uh, our fuel economy, or the TSFC is going to go up, because we're actually going to have to burn fuel just to push air out the engine. And we want to burn fuel to develop thrust. 
Now my personal favorite kind of an exhaust duct is a convergent divergent exhaust duct. Now I'm over exaggerating this duct here, but let's say the air is going in this direction, it's coming out that direction, and there's the rest of the engine. Here we'll just leave it to the exhaust duct. If we converge it enough, of course velocity will go up, static pressure will go down. If we constrict it enough at this point right here, we can actually get Mach 1.0 and before it it's less than Mach 1.0 and then after it or downstream it's going to be greater than now the reason for this is if we can get the shock wave going usually airflow slows down on the back side of a shock wave but that would be because if we didn't have an exhaust duct after that these gases could expand all they wanted to and the axial velocity would actually slow down. However, if we put a slightly diverging duct after it, the gases can only expand aft. They'll expand to the side just a little tiny bit, but since the gases can only expand aft, their velocity will go up. Yay, and if we're already at Mach 1, and then we go faster than Mach 1, then it'll be going faster than Mach 1. Yay. So, the convergent part of the duct, the gases are going slower than Mach 1 and get up to Mach 1. So they're right smack at Mach 1, at the most constricted spot. And then after they go past, hit Mach 1, and are expanding in the diverging duct, they'll exceed Mach 1. Wow, it's like I knew this stuff. Noise, jet engine noise. It's caused by the shearing effect of uh, air molecules uh, push crossing against other air molecules at different velocities. And you can get this shearing from inside of the engine off of the uh, compressor blades and the fan will contribute to noise coming out of the intake the uh, turbine blades uh, noise is coming out of the exhaust and inside of that engine you get all these blades turning and, and of course the combustion chamber is making noise so air is going to try to come out the case as well as try to come out the exhaust and the intake So here's a picture out of the Rolls-Royce on a turbofan, and the size of these areas is how much noise. This big blue area right here, that's how that combined with this area right here is a representation of the noise that comes off of the fan. And of course, we get noise off of the fan here, and of course, noise is going to come off of the fan out the back end of the du uh, exhaust duct, or the fan duct, rather. The turbine and the combustion chamber, this is how much of the noise is coming off of it. And then we've got noise because of shearing coming off of the jet nozzle. So that's where most of the air, most of the noise comes from. Okay, we can get rid of a lot of this noise, and we're going to. Um, let's see. Whoops you can make a duct if you, with noise absorbing material in it this this fan duct you can put material in it that absorbs noise you could even put a liner around the engine to absorb some of the noise and you can do that Here's a picture out of the Rolls-Royce textbook with noise absorbing material that can be installed inside of ducting. You can also change the design of the intake duct. Here's excuse me, here's another picture out of the 
the uh, Rolls Royce, it's got the intake duct on the bottom being longer, so as noise comes off of the compressor or the fan, it bounces off and goes upward, because really what we're worried about is the noise hitting the people on the ground. Give them some feet. And then a way to get rid of a lot of the noise coming out of the exhaust pipe is to do what's called hot and cold gas stream mixing, hot and cold stream mixing. Uh, particularly, it works really, it's been done on turbojets, uh, but it works really well on turbofans because we already have some cold air going across, the bypassing the engine, and it keeps the noise from hitting people on the ground quite so well. Here, I'm going to show you something. I've got a picture. Right here. If uh, if this is a runway, this picture's out of the Rolls Royce. Here's our runway, and here's our uh, takeoff path. We're going to be producing noise straight down and off to the sides, and it's hitting the ground at, at these points is where the issue is, especially if it's off of the airport. People that work at the airport don't notice the airport noise, I don't think. So it's really trying to get rid of the perceived noise of people on the ground. So one way to do that is to mix the gases. You can take a look at this right here and we've got hot gases coming out of the exhaust and then cold gases coming through the fan and they're going to mix and you're going to go mix. Well who cares about that? Here's another picture of how it's getting mixed. And here's our hot exhaust gases and here's some of the cold bypass gases. This hot and cold stream mixing uh, works like this. You gotta understand that the hotter the temperature air, the lower the frequency noise it generates. The colder the air, the higher the frequency noise. So warmer air makes low frequency noises and colder air makes higher frequency noises. Well, if you've ever listened to somebody's boombox or their loud stereo in a car, a lot of the noise that you hear is the low frequencies because that does not get absorbed by the car and does not get absorbed as it travels through the air nearly as much as the high frequency noise does. So if we're in an airplane flying up high and here's our jet engine, we'll say it's a turbofan, and we have sound energy going to the ground, if this is low frequency, then a lot of this energy is going to get to the ground. It will not be absorbed up by the atmosphere very much. But if it's a high frequency noise, then a lot of this noise energy is going to get absorbed as it travels through the air. So whoever's on the ground won't hear as much. So what we want to do is if we have to produce noise, let's produce it at a high frequency so by the time it gets down to the ground there will be less of it. Well that means we need cold air to be making the noise or what we can do is take this cold air, mix it with the hot air so it's cooler so it makes a higher frequency and so less noise gets to the ground because that higher frequency noise is absorbed by the atmosphere on the way down. And so here you can see a noise suppressor. That's what this thing in here is, a noise suppressor. Hey, it's like I knew this stuff. Interestingly enough, uh, FedEx uh, still flies 727s around, and they have engines that were designed in, in the 1960s. It's a low-bypass turbofan and they weren't going to be able to keep up with the increasing standards of FAA noise limitations at airports. Have you ever heard of stage 2, stage 3, stage 4 noise limitations? Um, so they had to decide, do we buy a different airplane with a lower uh, noise engine, or do we put different engines on this airplane, or do we try to mitigate how much noise it produces, and that was the choice they made. They redesigned the intake ducts, they put on cowling that absorbed more noise and they also put these noise suppressors to make the hot and cold uh, stream mixing occur 
they put noise suppressors on the back of the engine and now are meeting FAA noise standards. There's three reasons why turbofans and turboprops just by D, by pure coincidence of their design, make less noise than a turbojet. So let's see if I can find a blank spot here. Okay. So we'll do this on a turbofan. Okay, since a turbofan has the extra turbines, then it's going to be extracting energy out of that air, so the exhaust that does come out is at a lower velocity. Lower velocity equals less shearing. So there's one reason, just by having a lower exhaust velocity, we're going to have less noise, because the difference between uh, the gases leaving the core and the gases outside of the core are going to cause are going to be a less differential um, that's going to cause less shearing. Also, number two, so number one is lower core velocity equals lower shearing. Number two reason is that if we have a fan or a bypass, instead of the the airflow past the engine core being cruise speed, say 500 knots, it's at a higher speed, say 700 knots. So that means that these fast core gases coming out versus the gases uh, on the outside of the core, in this case the bypass air or the air going through the fan, again the differential is less because we've sped up this air on the outside of the engine. So if we have a higher bypass velocity, that's going to give us even less shearing than before because the difference between the velocity going past the engine because of the fan of the prop versus the velocity coming out the core, that difference is less. So now answer number three is that since we have, if we looked up the tailpipe of a turbo fan, this air coming out the fan has a little bit of a swirl to it, not very much, but a little bit of it. And especially if we run this duct back, which if you look on modern transport category jets, they run the duct way back, we're going to get mixing between the core air gases and the bypass gases just because of having a swirl to the air coming off of the propeller, which is going to be a lot of swirl, and or because we have a duct that goes way down the length of the engine. So that's going to cause a lot more cold and hot stream gas mixing, which, of course, we already know why that reduces. So we're going to have an increase in cold, hot stream mixing because of the bypass versus the core, even if we didn't have any specific uh, gizmos back here, like a noise suppressor, to make that happen. Now, noise is bad for you. Bad for you in two ways. Uh, it causes fatigue and if it's loud enough, it can cause hearing loss that does, that's non-recoverable. In fact, the only time in my life that I've ever induced pain upon myself in my ears was standing next to a jet engine, a very small APU as a matter of fact, and all I had was in my ears with the foam earplugs, and the intake noise was so loud that I actually experienced pain. So after that, I not only put in my foam earplugs, I also put on a noise attenuating headset whenever I was around that engine. And I'm sure, I'm absolutely positive that I do not hear as well now as I did before just because of that, you know. So if you're outside and somebody's running a jet engine nearby, you need to use hearing protection. Thrust reversers. Hey, if you're going to grow up and fly jets, you're probably going to fly something with a thrust reverser. If the runway is contaminated with ice, snow, water, sleet, hail, uh, 
thrust reversers at high speeds work even better than the brakes do. Um, so it's a standard practice on transport category jets, big biz jets, to use thrust reverse and, of course, on turboprops to use reverse pitch to help slow the airplane down. It actually costs less money to burn the fuel when you run the engine up. Uh, what you're going to do, let's just say here's your throttle quadrant in the airplane, and here's your throttle. And on these airplanes with reverse thrust, there's typically a lever right in front of, here's the instrument panel, right in front of the throttle. You pull the throttle all the way down to idle just as you're touching down, er, er, and get the nose down, er, and you move your hand up and grab the thrust reverse lever and you pull it back. So that's what you want to do, right? You want to slow down. You want to go the other direction. Just as you start to move it, that's where the thrust reverser doors pop out. And then the more that you pull the thrust reverse lever back, the more fuel is squirted into the engine. So the engine comes back up to a high power setting. Now you're burning a lot of fuel, but you've got to understand the wheel brakes. The wheel brakes, although it would cost less money to replace the parts themselves, if you just counted the parts cost for the brakes, maybe even the labor of the people you're paying to do it. But the airplane's out of service. If you have to keep replacing the brakes, you've got to pull the airplane into the hangar and it's got to get jacked up off of the ground. And if you've ever jacked up, you know, a 300,000 pound airplane, you can't just do it in five minutes. You've got to be very careful. So then you can change, then you can work on the brakes. But this airplane, if it's sitting here in this hangar, it can't, you can't charge money for it to fly in it because nobody wants to pay money to sit in an airplane while it's up on jacks. So the, when I talk about net cost is less, it's because you're not losing all of that profit when the airplane is taken out of service to replace the brakes. You do not have to take the airplane out of service just because you're running the thrust reversers. There's two basic types of thrust reversers, post-exit and pre-exit. Post-exit is where you put the uh, thrust reverser after the exhaust pipe. Here's one uh, thrust reverser on a DC-9 slash uh, MD-80, and the exhaust air comes out and is routed forward. Most of the time, these clamshell ducts, clamshell doors, don't cause any drag, but when you first pull that thrust reverse lever, when you first pull that thrust reverse lever, the first thing that happens is these doors pop open. And as you continue to pull the thrust reverser farther aft, then you get more air out the engine. So that's post thrust reverser. Now this is actually a low bypass turbofan. So in addition to the core air, there's also bypass air. You know, there's actually a duct in here. So this post-reverse, post-exit thrust reverser is actually reversing core air and it's reversing bypass air. Pre-exit is where you change or reverse the airflow before it goes through the engine core. And typically, this is only, this, not typically, this is only found on turbofans. This pre-exit is really talking about uh, reversing the fan or reversing the bypass air. So I'll show you a picture here. Here's a picture I got off of the Rolls-Royce site. On this particular engine, the uh, engine cowling moves aft and this this door right here, which used to be right down here, moves up. It's flipped up. This one is flipped up so the bypass air can't get out. And inside of this little, uh, I don't know what you call it, is little curved pieces of metal. So the air is forced to go out and blow slightly forward. I got a different picture here. Here's one. This is a thrust reverser on a C-17 cargo plane the Air Force has. And these are just a whole bunch of little tiny ducts. So the air comes out and goes forward. And there are very, very few 
I have seen some turbo fans just a very very few where they actually reversed the thrust on the fan and they popped out thrust reverser doors off of the exhaust and had a pre exit thrust reverser and had a post exit thrust reverser but that's very unusual if the bypass fan is huge you know if here's the size of the bypass fan compared to the size you know here's our fan Whee. compared to the diameter of the engine core this reverse thrust here is not going to do any good it's just going to go into the back of the fan so if it's a big high really really high bypass turbo fan they are not going to put a post exit and they're just going to do the pre exit and this part right here is going to slide aft so the air this part right here is going to slide aft so that bypass air can be reversed and it'll just have a pre-exit now whoops. business jets even if they have a reasonably high turbo fan they're pretty short they're pretty small and they run this duct all the way back so what they'll usually do is on a business jet is have pre-exit only a correction have post exit only but this post exit reverses the bypass air and it reverses the core air it reverses the bypass air and it reverses the core air the most effective time to use thrust reversers is at the highest speed possible which essentially means as soon as you touch down you're going to use your thrust reversers if you're going to use them at all here when should you not use reverse thrust well <laughs> not in flight is typically a problem the thrust reverser doors aren't designed to handle that much stress at high forward speeds and it messes up uh, you gotta have you gotta jets need to fly fast to get enough air over those wings so you don't typically need the thrust reversers in flight um, if you're landing on the ground here I'll show you this picture if you're landing on the ground you'll notice that here's the 747 the air is coming in and the re thrust is getting reversed you can actually see the air coming down now the problem is if you're going slow enough you can actually th throw a rock and get it back up into the front of the engine and have it get sucked into the engine so typically not less than 50 knots that varies by airplane If you do it below 50 knots, it's possible that you'll push the air forward down on the ground enough and it'll come up front and get sucked into the engine. If you're going fast enough forward, by the time this rock gets up here, the airplane's farther ahead of it. So the rock just comes up and goes back because you've got such a forward, a fast forward speed. So generally speaking, don't use the threat. You want to use the thrust reversers as soon as you touch down and you go to a high power setting and then re get rid of the thrust reverser stop using the thrust reverse by the time you get down to 50 knots and like i said uh i've not i've only seen one airplane that you can use thrust reverse in flight and that's the C17 cargo plane but the military has a good reason to use the reverse thrust up at the sky um up in the sky um unless you have one of those category 3 uh auto land systems where everything happens for you which typically is not the case even on brand new transport category jets uh, you're going to be hand flying the airplane during landing and you the pilot are going to be deciding when to use the thrust reverse not the computer so it's almost always computer controlled and those doors that have to move whether it's the whole cowling that moves or you just have some clamshell doors at the back I've seen systems that are powered off of bleed air off of the engine uh, off of hydraulic actuators off of the one of the hydraulic systems and I've also seen some that run off of engine oil pressure so you need to know how does that thrust reverser how is it powered uh, if it was powered by hydraulics and that hydraulic system failed then that hi that uh, thrust reverser wouldn't work I'd like to know about that before I land me personally anyway 
And like I said before, the engine power has to be reduced to idle. Typically, there is some kind of uh, engagement mechanism. So until you pull this down to idle, it won't even let you grab the thrust reverse levers and move them until the power lever has come all the way down to idle. Then, and when I say full power, uh, that's not a, an exact power setting because it varies. You're going to be looking at the exhaust gas temperature gauge and you may be looking at uh, RPM. And if you have a red line and, the, and you keep pulling the thrust reverse lever up, if you looked at fuel flow, the fuel flow needle would be getting higher and higher and higher, and but you're need, gonna, gonna watch, want to watch out and make sure that you don't go past redline EGT. If you've got a redline RPM, you want to make sure you don't go past redline RPM. So when I say you go to full power, you go to a really high power setting, but you do not, you do not exceed any engine parameters. Now, I'm gonna teach you something here. I know. Teach me something. No, no. Let's say you got a runway. And let's say that you're operating under Part 91, FAR 91. You're a business jet. And let's say that you calculate that you need to, this distance to accelerate. And then if you had to abort the takeoff just before rotating an engine quit and you had to slam on the brakes, uh, it it would take you this distance right here to decelerate. That would work out just fine even if it was 121 or 135. But let's just say it's the same runway but it's a hot high altitude day and it takes you this far to accelerate and then to decelerate you'd end up over here. Well this is okay for part 91. Under Part 91, it's okay if, in a 172, for instance, if uh, if there's a 1,000-foot runway here, and to accelerate, you'd have to get up to 800. It would take you 800 feet to be able to accelerate and just prior to liftoff, slam on the brakes, and you'd end up going off of the runway. This would be legal to attempt it under Part 91, but it's not okay for 121 and 135. 121 and 135 says that if you abort the takeoff at the last possible moment, that's called V1, you don't have to write that down, at decision speed, which is typically just a little bit just prior before you pull the nose up, and you have to decelerate and do an aborted takeoff, you have to have enough asphalt left here to be able to stop before you get to the end of the asphalt. If the weather is such or you've got the airplane heavy or the runway's too short and you calculate that your acceleration deceleration distance is going to put you off the end of the runway then you cannot even attempt the takeoff now when you do these calculations it's based on using no thrust reverse and if you've got propellers no pro pitch reverse no reverse pitch It is, however, based on you using your anti-skid brakes. And I'm not going to go into how anti-skid brakes need to take AS356 airframe systems and components. But it's based on using the anti-skid brakes, because they almost always are set up to work, and you check them before takeoff. But if you lost one of your engines, you wouldn't be able to use full reverse thrust. You might be able to use a little, but not very much on the good engines, because you'd yaw too much and go off the runway. So for normal takeoff calculations, oops. You plan your accelerate and decelerate distance based on not using any reverse thrust, but based on using the anti-skid brakes. And if you're part 121 or you're part 135, you have to be able to accelerate, then at decision speed just before you rotate, you have to be able to not use reverse thrust, slam on the brakes like crazy, and stop before you end, out of, end off at the end of the runway. Under part 91, it's okay if this total distance here is off the end of the runway. So it's, it's kind of okay to kill people under part 91.
you have any questions about exhaust systems, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how I could have done this lecture, recorded lecture better, I would certainly be happy to hear better ways to do things. Thank you.